Eccoci, dovremmo essere in diretta. Approfitto dell'opportunità di avere gli interpreti. Ok, we are live. I am going to speak Italian today as interpreters are here for us. You have the interpretation channel where you can choose your language. We have English, French and Spanish and Italian, sorry. First of all, I'd like to thank all journalists and media professionals who accepted our invitation today to speak at our meeting, at our roundtable on behalf of Transform Italia and Transform Europe. I can say that um, we are committed to work at this project in order to strengthen the relationships of our media in Europe. I am going to leave the floor immediately to Alessia, who is going to be the first moderator for this uh, session. We're going to have <clears throat> two sessions today. The second session is going to take place from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock with a small round table with our journalists. Alessia, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Roberto. My name is Alessia Gasperini. I curated the relationship with the media for this Media Alliance project. It is, as the name says, um, a an alliance that we want to create among all uh, left-wing media of the European Union in order to raise awareness in the public opinion. We want to create a public opinion that can be first European and second national, because the problem is that citizens in the European Union feel European somehow, but actually their opinion on everyday uh, facts of their life is strongly influenced on their national media, what they read on national media or uh, here on the TV. So often mainstream media, national mainstream media in states are influenced by a neoliberalist um, narrative. Our initiative aims at um, creating a network between left-wing European magazines, media, newspapers, in order to solve this problem somehow, this influence on citizens. The COVID-19 pandemics, moreover, highlighted how important it is to have European citizens that are well informed on current affairs and that have access on the public debate in order to create and develop ideas that are their own without any influence on mainstream media. This is our first public event. We have, we have journalists from all over Europe who are ready to discuss with us in this sense. We're going to, it's going to be a round table, so we're going to discuss among us of important topics. So for example, for example, we're going to discuss fake news in the mainstream media, the uh, management of the pandemics in the single states, at the European level, the vaccination campaigns, the um, situation of right-wing movements uh, recently who lived a momentum, especially in some countries. So if we are ready, I'd like to start a first round. I uh, would like to start with Roberto Musacchio. Am I, can you hear me? Yes, okay, perfect. Um, I will start I, on behalf of Transform Italia. We've um, created a website um, in, uh, uh, recently. It's, we publish every week and we call ourselves the newsroom. We decided to start what we call the 
fight for ideas. Often, uh, newspapers in Italy say um, the European Union is asking for something. So this is our communication in Italy. This is our information. What we, we're trying to do, what we try to do, it was to create a new way of communicating. So this year, during the pandemics, we tried and give some more push on this. This example of the pandemics is helping us, in my opinion, to um, understand what we need. We'll start, I'll start from now, these hours recently. I don't know about the other countries, but in Italy, we just found out that um, they are going to remove the patents on vaccination. The um, president of the US talked about this. And so after the work we've done over these last few months in order to have the uh, draft law um, that uh, European citizens uh, uh, are, uh, are proposed, have proposed to the European Commission. In Italy, we, uh, got, uh, we collected more than 50,000 signatures for this proposal. But uh, the, uh, what Biden said in, uh, got the first pages, uh, the front covers of all newspapers. This is something that always uh, struck us. It's a good it's a good thing that we talk about this, but um, I mean, we cannot wait for um, someone to, to talk about this, uh, our savior somehow, the US president. We must be in charge of our own democracy as citizens. So the pandemics really, um, was a real benchmark of this. It enabled us to understand what's happening even more. So we tried to highlight um, that the pandemic affected I, uh, society. That was already uh, taking uh, care of other, other big problems. It would have been very interesting and to, to make a comparison with other countries to see how this situation was being handled in other European countries, how what uh, actions were carried out. We, see, we saw that some countries uh, faced this in a way and some others decided to tackle it in another way. So public opinions couldn't know. Um, they, they only... Uh, they only got to know things in an indirect way, what happened in one country or another. So there was no uh, united vision from the left of how, to, to, uh, how this uh, pandemic was faced. And here we also have uh, um, denialism, uh, um, fake news. So what should we do? At the moment, uh, we have uh, next generation EU plans. It would be interesting to understand what's happening in one country or the other. In our opinion, the Italian plan is ready and it is a plan that is relaunching our young. I read something about the Spanish and Portuguese plans. So being able to communicate in real time what is happening in other countries I, I was talking about patents, for example, but it is important to know about uh, the next generation EU plans, the future of Europe. We're going to have a conference on this and to see what role um, the left wing parties have to play. So this is what I wanted to say just at the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Now, let's start with the first round table of our uh, European journalists. We'll, we're going to start with Gael De Santis Humanite. Can you explain to us your role in the, in the magazine and what they do? Can you tell us a little bit about Humanite and uh, what is the situation of the left-wing parties in France? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to speak French, it's going to be easier. Uh, L'Humanite is a uh, publication that was created in 1904. So in France, it's one of the uh, well-established uh, publications together with Le Figaro and the other ones founded by Jean Jaurès. 
and it was the organ of the Communist Party. Today it's left uh, towards uh, Transformation Sociale, so all the trade unions and other forces are well placed here. We have also Les Insoumis. So whatever is more left than the socialist parties. So we cover everything that is part of the socialist uh, side. So we try and create uh, an environment for a dialogue amongst all types of voices of the interested people um, interested in social transformation. So this is a publication, as Roberto said, uh, that allows us to put forth our battles. For example, you quoted the example of the Biden administration in terms of the um, world uh, trade organization. This is a part of a dialogue. Uh, we have other forces like the France Insoumise, the Green Party, and so on and so forth. Uh, they've been dealing with this, but this has not been at the forefront. So l'humanité has taken part in this dialogue. So here you see the page, the front page, the night before Biden's decision. We were already speaking about the vaccine um, fight and battle. Uh, we were talking about uh, the pandemic. This was uh, something that we put forth in terms of what Emmanuel Macron was doing. So the connection with the lobbying world, with the big pharma, so the French politics, it was and has been influenced by private interests that uh, are the ones we are well aware of. So here you see another cover about the possibility of uh, uh, changing the patenting situation after Biden's uh, decision. So the situation of the left is quite complex in France. Since the 60s, we have had this movement of social transformation, a uh, more moderate left collaborating together with uh, François Hollande. For example, there was a breakup, the left splintered, so it's really difficult now to work together. 2022, we'll have the presidential elections, and this is a two away system, so a two-step system. Today, the risk is that uh, we will still have uh, Macron and Marine Le Pen of the far right, 25%, um, according to the uh, forecast. So uh, we have a representation of the moderate left, 32%. So we are trying to identify a figure that uh, can gather everybody around the same table in the leftist area because the socialists say, all right, we have a certain legitimation and the Zonsoumi uh, have a different uh, opinion. The Greens, we said, okay, we also have a legitimation because we've been working really well at a European level and the communists the same thing because we are going to find out the next weekend if they will have a um, candidature for the presidential election. So we have a left which is highly divided and the role of our publication uh, will be to identify who does what in the left. So we have a political left, but there is a social movement as well that has had a voice in l'humanité. 
also when we consider, for example, the uh, healthcare situation, we have put forth the problem of the hospitals and the uh, support that has been given to the hospitals at a national level. So I believe that uh, we will have a second part of this debate to be able to continue on those topics. And that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gael. And now let's move on to Leonardo Filippi. Left, Italy. Can you talk to us a little bit about the uh, newspaper and about the left-wing situation in Italy? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we do. Okay, first of all, hello, everyone. I'd like to say hello to our colleagues uh, here with us today. I'd like to say hello to, the, to all participants. I'd like to thank Transform Europe and Transform Italy for this very important event. Our um, newspaper really um, believes in this kind of events. The, uh, left news, uh, the Left magazine, it's a weekly magazine. It's a left magazine, left-wing magazine. It's made up of um, one director and three journalists. We are published every Friday and um, our goal is to gather all voices of our left-wing families, big left-wing families that are very fragmented in Italy at the moment. Our goal is to have them all together and to create a united left wing uh, in Italy. We do it every week with um, investigation. It's uh, investigative reports and this is what we do in our weekly magazine. I'm going to, uh, to, to mention a couple of topics uh, like rights of women, rights of migrants. Um, etc. So this were this work of taking together, to, to putting together and bringing together all voices of the left wing. We do that uh, every week and we try and um, and we try to, uh, to work uh, just giving a voice to all different positions within the left-wing parties. You were asking me what is the left-wing situation of our country? Well, it's a very complicated question. For those who are following us from abroad, I would like to remind you that at the moment our um, government in Italy is a government of the president, the prime minister. We have many um, parliament forces in, uh, government, in the government at the moment. And we have the extreme right wing, Fratelli d'Italia, and there is a small uh, component of Sinistra Italiana, a left wing party. So besides this, this is a strong opposition made by Rifondazione uh, Comunista, who is part of the uh, left European party and other uh, left wing uh, forces. And we hope uh, to be the home for them, a place where they can debate and um, in order to unite, not to split and uh, divide. Then there is another component of uh, our political forces in Italy. It has to do with social movements. Uh, we often underline the fact that we have three um, social movements that are particularly uh, important in Italy. The uh, women, um, the women um, party, non una di meno, the environment party, it is very active in Italy. They, um, they are very mature, even if they, uh, it's made up of very young people. And uh, the movement against um, 
big works, um, the major works, and these are moments that are um, they start. This this uh, last this latter movement is was done in order to um, go against these major public works, these um, infrastructures. So they oppose this, and it's not only uh, local but they imagine a different future for the entire country. So we try and give a voice to all these uh, left-wing components uh, of in every, every week. We try and do that in the best possible way. In terms of percentage of voters, uh, our left-wing parties and not particularly um, alive, let's say. But as Roberto was saying, um, we have many collaborators of our uh, a magazine like Roberto and Alessia. But uh, and as Roberto was saying, on left, we launched the European campaign for the uh, vaccination since uh, our since uh, fall. For many weeks in Italy, um, many uh, political forces, also the ones that are part of the government, like the uh, Movimento Cinque Stelle, the Five Star Movement, on, or the PD, the Democratic Party, they had made statements saying that uh, stopping patents could be a right choice. But on the 12th of March, Italy um, stated that they, we were against the uh, WTO decision to stop patents on vaccination. So all our democratic parties um, now declared that they are in favor of this choice. So we must explain this, we must um, translate them in a simple language that can be understood by everyone all over Italy and all over Europe. And a project like today's, of course, is giving a, a contribution to, to make this possible. Thank you, Leonardo. Now, I'd like to leave the floor to our journalist of strike.eu from Poland. Malgorzata Kulbaczewska, can you tell us a little bit about the situation of Poland and your newspaper? Be here with you. As uh, Alessia has just said, I am a journalist of Strike EU. Strike, I think there is no need to translate it for everyone. And uh, this is one of the biggest left wing media in Poland, uh, a news portal uh, aiming to analyze the, our reality from a strongly left wing socialist point of view. And uh, basically, uh, we are, uh, as I said, we are the news portal, left wing news portal, and we are sadly one of the only. Uh, media in Poland strongly positioning themselves as left-wing for uh, both the situation of the left uh, in general in Poland and the situation of left media is uh, quite, a, quite a tough one. Uh, Poland has emerged uh, from the 90s uh, into the 21st century um, as a country strong, devastated by a neoliberal transformation, uh, which has uh, brought us democracy, which brought us parliamentary democracy, but uh, at the same time destroyed the social achievements uh, of the Polish People's Republic. Uh, the, so, um, and also brought a big disorientation to Polish left wingers. So, uh, it it will be not a big exaggeration from my part if I say that until a, a few years ago, Polish left was absolutely not ready to face the challenges of modern world, uh, the ecological challenges, uh, uh, questions of, in, of growing inequalities, uh, the question of neoliberalism and why this system is no longer working. And only now, at this point, only now we can really say that Polish left Listen, is looking for the answers to these questions at the same time taking part in uh, well everyday political struggles. 
And uh, the same refers also to Polish working class and its organization for the trade unions in Poland emerged uh, destroyed from, the, from this transformation period. Of course, it does not mean that their structures disappeared, but uh, in fact, they are still reinventing themselves how to represent workers uh, in modern economy and how to face the challenges of uh, this uh, COVID crisis and uh, permanent capitalist crisis coming back after the cycle. So, um, uh, what can I say about uh, the situation of the left wing in Poland? We are, uh, luckily, we are now having a social democratic party in the parliament and uh, just a few days ago, we could see how it is important to have a left-wing media supporting this political force as well. For uh, over last week, Polish well, in Poland, we had a huge debate in Poland over the next generation EU, over the funds that may be that will be coming to Poland to revive our economy, and over the whole idea of regenerating the European Union after the crisis. And uh, sadly, the debate came out on a very low level, or it was immediately uh, just brought down only to national level, whether the opposition should help the government to secure votes to get the recovery fund in the, uh, guaranteed by the parliament, or should the opposition artificially prolong the crisis so that the right-wing government falls and the liberal opposition can, can take power. As you all see, this is not really the level of debate that we need in the crisis moment of the, in the crisis moment of the whole European Union. And uh, at the moment when we really need to decide what was wrong in the capitalist system, in the neoliberal system before the uh, COVID crisis and on what grounds we want to rebuild the economy and rebuild social relations after the pandemics. And uh, that is why we need in Poland a big, a stronger cooperation with the left-wing media from abroad as well. We need to secure, we need to hear what you say, what you write. We need to uh, be more uh, integrated, not only with European Union in, I would say, structural, uh, the in, in structures and institutions, but also with the pan-European debate, what is going on in the left-wing, uh, among the left-wing thinkers, what is going on among social democratic activists all around Europe. And um, that is why uh, I think that the initiatives like today's are very important for, uh, for Polish public opinion. We are having the chance to, to experience a whole new uh, dimension of European integration. And European integration has already brought a lot of important modernization changes in Poland and we we need to proceed further that way. Thank you very much. Grazie mille Malgozata e adesso diamo la parola a Aris Gulemis che rappresenta la testata IPG. Okay, I've just been unmuted, I think so. Can you hear me now? <clears throat> Can you? Yes. Okay. Well, I start, yes, with, uh, I start with a newspaper. Well, Epochi is, is a Greek radical left weekly uh, founded in uh, 1987 by those members of the Communist Party of, of Greece interior who did not accept uh, the decision taken by a Congress majority to change its name and identity, left and formed another party that in 1991 was named ACOA, Renovative Communist and Ecological Left. So initially we were the newspaper of an ambitious effort of communist renewal under very difficult conditions. The effort was not successful, I must admit that. And after some electoral failures, Epochi embraced and served Akoa's new idea 
of the unity of the Greek radical left, which eventually led to the creation of the coalition of Syriza that in 2013 was transformed to a single party. Since then, our newspaper critically supports Syriza being close today to its left tendency of the 53 plus. However, independently of party or tendency affiliations, Epochi has always been an open-minded, high-quality, independent newspaper, which shows much interest for the ideas and practices of social movements in Greece, Europe, and throughout the world. Although not legally a cooperative, we are a solidary and participative project which has no leaders. The contents of each issue are decided in the, in the editorial board, which meets via Zoom twice a week, plus some hours on Fridays. This Friday I cannot be present. Uh, this group is smaller for the front page. The board consists of 27 members, only five from the old guard, in which I belong, of which 14 are journalists who either work in other media or are pensioners. Nobody is paid for writing articles or taking interviews. The only professionals are three young women who are paid for contracting contributors, proofreading and typesetting, activities that they perform on top of their journalistic job. We are mainly a printed publication with our edition being available only for subscribers outside Greece. We circulate on Saturday and our price is two euros. Every Sunday, all contents are posted in our website. Normally, the newspaper has 32 pages. However, twice a month, the number increases to 40 and even 48 due to the inclusion of various thematic supplements of which the most important is a regular monthly review of books. Our financial sources are uh, a small series of allowance, revenues from advertisements mainly of public corporations and publishing houses, and regular contributions of a big number of friends and comrades who have a list of over 600 people. This is the story of Epochi. So let's now go to the question of the left in Greece. I will omit uh, a part because I'm running out of time regarding uh, the political situation in Greece. I hope that Argiris will speak about it uh, under a new authoritarian and neoliberal uh, government of new democracy. And I go straight to the situation in the left. In terms of electoral support, but not of membership or mobilization ability, the much bigger force of the left in Greece is Syriza, coalition of the radical left. In the July 2019 elections, it got 31.5%, a huge percentage, I would say, and with 86 deputies, is the major opposition in the Greek parliament. Since these elections, following the decision of its leadership, Syriza is in a process of widening, aiming to attract people who belong mainly to the, <coughs> to the center and the center left, some of them being in the past 
member, members of the X PASOK. Symbolically, this widening is expressed by its new name, Syriza Progressive Alliance, which was decided again by its leadership without a prior Congress decision and which and practically is seen through the, this, I mean, uh, this, I could say, transformation through the appointment of, a, of new organs, mainly via cooptation. Whether this widening is a tactical move aiming to only gain electoral, electorally, give electoral gains, or is the first step of a real transformation of Syriza to a leader's social democratic party remains to be seen. Whatever one thinks or wishes, and there are different opinions among party members and supporters, Syriza's present percentage in the polls ranges between 22 and 24 percent, which is much lower than its score in the 2019 elections. For the leadership and some party members, this is very frustrating, especially in view of the authoritarian and neoliberal policies of the right-wing government and its failure to deal with the pandemic. Personally, I believe that this percentage is extraordinary. For, the, for a party of the radical left. Epochi, and I finish with that, is not indifferent to what is happening in Syriza Progressive Alliance and supports those in it who wish to retain the party's radical identity. At the same time, we try to become a public space of the whole radical left by hosting articles interviews and reports referring to the Communist Party of Greece, Kukwe, uh, Varoufakis Party, Mera 25, the Greens, as well as the non-parliamentary left. It goes without saying that true and faithful to our tradition, we also follow and present the activities of social movements consisting mainly of young people who slowly but steadily are returning to the streets. Thank you. Grazie mille Aris. Adesso and diamo la parola a Milena Gedges che viene da Europa e rappresenta Milena Gedges from Transform Europe. Thank you. Hi, hello everyone. Um, I think you can hear me well, right? Yes, okay. So I'm, I'm Elena. I just recently joined Transform Europe. I'm, I'm sitting in Vienna right now. I was asked from Roberto Morea to give a brief um, introduction into the general landscape, political landscape here in Austria, since we have unfortunately no, nobody from Austria for, um, who could make it for this first meeting. So I'm not an expert. I'm not speaking from an expert journalist point of view, but I'll still try to give you a brief overview of what's going on in Austria. Um, so obviously, as you all might know, we have a, a coalition of um, conservative center-right Austrian People's Party with uh, Chancellor Sebastian Kurz and with, uh, in a coalition with the Green Party. And yeah, obviously the day-to-day -day business now is focusing on pandemic-related attempts to manage the health crisis that we're all in and I think it's more or less the same situation on a daily basis in Europe and obviously facing the similar shortcomings that we're having so, um, such as vaccine supply a uh, plan for vaccination but also reopenings after various kinds of lockdowns that we also had here in Austria um, but besides that, maybe of relevance uh, is the rather large political scandal that is uh, engulfing Austria's political class right now. It, I think if I remember correctly, the first leaks that were actually um, covered by a weekly 
mainly covered, at least for Austria, by a weekly magazine or weekly newspaper called Falte, um, who's a rather broad liberal, left liberal uh, week, uh, weekly newspaper. And they've started covering this whole um, issue by beginning of February, I think. Um, and in a nutshell, it's a cache of private text messages between the Chancellor, Sebastian Kurz, and some of his deputies, also ministers and other correspondence that was uncovered by Austrian authorities as part of a sweeping investigation into political corruption. And this all accumulated, so to say, um, in the past months. And we're talking about secret financing of the Conservative Party and in general corrupt practices within Austria's main state holding company that came, um, that were really revealed in the past uh, weeks and months. So on the one hand, this could be, yeah, hardly surprising in political circles, of course, and there's also nothing new in, in total, but um, especially for courts, um, government, who tried to refashion Austria's um, conservative party when he took over. This is kind of a, a backlash, I would say. And obviously, um, he convinced um, quite a lot of Austrians by that time that he was serious with that, but it actually turned out to not be the case. So um, that's kind of um, uh, yeah, a big thing right now in, in, in Austrian politics and also uh, concerning the, me the media coverage. Um, on the situation of the left, it's, it's quite hard for me to kind of summarize that, but maybe at least have a, um, say something about the Green, since the Green Party, since they're also part of the government. Um, I mean, again, that's my point of view <laughs> from the, uh, uh, or at that time, but, they have missed, I think, so far to obtain their real fair share within the government. And they rather rather have become, and that's due, mainly due to this message control that uh, Chancellor Kurz is, is doing. Um, they've become the scapegoat um, of the pandemic related policy measures that didn't, that did go wrong or weren't implemented successful, successfully. And we also had the recent resignation of the green health minister, um, who uh, made a quite, well, I don't know if it's remarkable, but a quite personal speech um, upon his resignation day. And that was, uh, of course, to the dislike of many Green uh, voters also. But yeah, so the, the Green Party has, there's um, a lot of um, disappointment, I think, um, there. And Maybe one last point to um, the, maybe that's also relevant to the project that Transform Italy has started. There's a lot of, um, in the past two years, but especially in the last year, um, there emerged a lot of various online so-called PR media that produce, that are um, just online web pages that produce interest led, I would say, propaganda. And this obviously has quite little to do with journalism and with providing non-biased information, but it's, it's, um, they, so that it's quite easy for them to, to, um, to have such new online web pages to present a somehow professional surface, but in the end that only extensively spreads links and sponsored postings of party officials via social media. And it's hard for especially young readers, I would say, um, to, to um, differentiate between propaganda postings and real media. And um, that's especially worrying because it happens in a time when all serious or more reliable media outlets do suffer from massive loss of income and scarce editorial resources so and this has been for Austria this has been the case for um, media web pages that are closely related to the, the chance the the FLP um, the the party of Chancellor Kurz but also for the right-wing populist freedom party of Austria so it's a bit worrisome and that's um, yeah so as um, as it concerns the media landscape 
yes so that that would it, that's uh, that's it from my part i would say it would be really great if we could get somebody on board from from austria to um take this work over thank you grazie mille milena adesso diamo la parola thank you milena now i'll leave the floor to Dagano, who represents Mondo Brown, and who will tell us about the situation of the left wing in Spain, which is a quite hot topic. Thank you. We cannot hear you. Lena? Good morning, everybody. Um, well, I'm so sorry to join late, and I'm, we have to, uh, to send to the paper. To send the paper today, and we are um, we are in a rush with a lot of uh, work. But uh, uh, I wouldn't uh, miss uh, this uh, chance of um, talking together. Um, well, the situation um, of uh, our the political situation of our country. Imagine you you know about uh, the recent um, results of the Madrid uh, regional elections. Um, and well, uh, it was uh, very disappointed for the for the left, and um, uh, the situation is as uh, you know that uh, the right um, won uh, almost the absolute uh, majority. Uh, she didn't, but uh, she almost uh, did. Well, um, uh, now in Madrid, uh, uh, we have a very special situation because uh, it's not um, a place where we have a regional uh, politic, but it's like a national politic. And they are trying to, to show that uh, what's happening in Madrid is what's uh, happening, is going to happen in, in all Spain, which uh, is not uh, really true because the Madrid situation is a very completely different of uh, the rest of, uh, or very different from the rest of uh, the, the other regions of, uh, of Madrid. So as you know, after the results, uh, the, well, the political uh, campaign was very, very, very hard. It was just um, doing uh, between the term of uh, freedom, which was represented by the, by the right, by the very um, um, right party we have, the Popular Party, PP. And so they, they said that uh, they were the freedom and they were uh, freedom or communism. And so the other side was uh, a democracy or fascism. So it was very polarized uh, situation. And at the end, um, well, the right is uh, on the power for the last uh, 26 years in Madrid. But uh, now uh, it's uh, much stronger. It's also because of the situation, the freedom, they, they want to, you know, they want to be, the, I don't know the, the name. Well, the, the, well, the leaders of the freedom and so, it's going to happen that uh, now we are going to finish the, the state of, um, you know, the restrictions of timetables. And uh, from this Saturday, uh, the restaurant will be open till 12 o'clock and we can go uh, for, um, for having a beer at, uh, till very late, you know. So it was a very, very stupid uh, campaign. It was very radical. It was uh, with uh, ballots, uh, sending in, in envelopes to public iglesias and uh, to ministers. And um, well, the situation was very hard. The, um, well, we have the, the spoir or the, um, we, we, we thought if with a bigger participation, it will be better for the, for the left, but uh, it doesn't happen like, like this. And, um, uh, well, imagine uh, it's also people wanted uh, to, you know, uh, they are tired of the situation of the pandemic and uh, well, they, it's what uh, has happened, as you know, uh, uh, Pablo Iglesias has uh, resigned of uh, all the political, his political responsibilities. 
And now uh, we are on a, on a moment um, to, to think about, um, well, how we're going to, to deal, no? So we think the, the unity is uh, more important than ever. And as uh, I offered you last time in our last meeting, uh, we are uh, going to publish uh, an analysis of uh, the results and the, how the situation is nowadays. And um, we hope to, we have to receive it uh, today, along the day, to send it the paper. So if you want, uh, I can send it uh, to you if you want to, if someone thinks it's uh, useful for them to have this article, uh, to know the situation. And so is the is our political situation. I don't know if you want to, uh, we, uh, we talk about uh, our paper. Yes, or we did uh, the other day. Well, we have um, this year, the, our party is the uh, first century of our party. We are celebrating it. It's a celebration along uh, the whole year. It started uh, last year by November. And uh, our uh, paper uh, has, uh, is um, uh, 90 years old. We have a printed paper with um, the printed paper. We have uh, about 9,000 um, copies every month, and we have the online paper too. And the situation is that, uh, is that uh, we are working the, the director and uh, who is in a meeting today, and I mean, and uh, so, so today we are a bit in Ras, as uh, I told you. And uh, well, we have a paper of uh, 36 uh, pages with a cultural uh, uh, special pages uh, of eight pages. And uh, our, uh, we are um, the paper of the Communist Party but uh, we have a lot of um, freedom to organize uh, our paper. Uh, we have a, a network of um, um, people of contributors, and uh, we every month uh, we ask uh, some of the people about uh, ideas and projects for the next paper, and then we select, we, we, we program the, the printed paper, and, and we work with that with it. We decided what are the more important articles uh, we need in international and, and economic, uh, national, uh, cultural things. And we, we are covering it with uh, interviews or articles. Or uh, we used to ask uh, who is the person who knows more about that, who is uh, uh, the people who, who uh, is working that, uh, that issue in the parliament or like the. Um, uh, legislation for a uh, memoric uh, history or democratic history we are uh, working on now or, or whatever. And so we try, uh, we, we ask them to, to write for us and to explain them. We have a, an international um, section. Uh, we have a lot of information um, because we have a lot of relationship with uh, Latin American forces and um, people there. And, um, but uh, we don't have um, too much information from, from Europe, even if we are part of, uh, of Europe. We have uh, very uh, active uh, people who are, uh, is, uh, the, is the, the structure of uh, um, communist uh, people in the abroad. Uh, and so there are young, a lot of young people, very active, uh, they read very well. And so we are working a lot with them. But uh, we'll be very happy to, uh, to broaden the information about uh, Europe. So I'm thinking that um, we would like uh, a lot to have, like uh, what uh, you were talking now about how the situation of the left is in, the, in your countries. So I think it will be uh, very interesting if we have a, we open a section in our paper uh, to see uh, how is the landscape uh, of uh, the political situation in our different countries or our different uh, regions or yeah, and um, how is this, the political situation what's uh, going on and the situation of the of the left in the in that countries 
So I think it, it will help us uh, to know uh, each other, uh, you know, no, no, us, the people who are uh, sitting on the front of the computer today, but uh, all our people to have uh, from first hand what's happening in Italy, what's happening in Belgium, what's happening in Poland, what's happening in Portugal. Uh, so it will be will be fantastic, and I think it will be the you know very very good way to to know each other. Um, Thank you, Gemma. I agree with that. I would like to close our round table. Of you, yourselves, and your left wing party. Saluto particolare a Gemma perché mi piace il bicchiere mezzo pieno. I to see a full glass. We saw what happened in Spain. Pablo Iglesias participated in the electoral campaign and increased votes by 45%. And we lost that the left wing list increased by 30% compared to the votes that got three years ago. This shows that the left wing did fight against the right wing and extreme right. And this is a great heritage that we all, despite the bitterness caused by failure and Pablo's loss, we at least can say that. We're happy for everything that our colleagues did in Spain. I'd like to keep being optimistic by saying that we propose during the elections to, we propose the suspension of patents. I know that the Democratic Party and all the other ministries had great influence on this decision. And I believe this is very important because it happens not only in Europe, but in the rest of the world. In Europe, those who participated in the Genoa movement started with those activities in Italy and in other parts of Europe. And the way this alliance against the patents divided, something really was created with trade unions, NGOs, and other movements. And this is our victory. This is a step forward towards the way we want to do things. And it was really something important for everyone to suspend patents. And if we keep looking in an optimistic way to the whole situation, we had a meeting in Greece yesterday. It was very important because it was also related to the pandemic. All trade unions participated. The only trade union showed us what the situation is in Greece. What does the government want to do about the pandemic? Instead of hiring nurses, they want to reform all jobs, and they actually want to hit trade unions by reducing, by increasing, sorry, the working hours of nurses. This is what the right wing wants to do. And another important thing was giving money to media. And that was another cause of mistrust towards these politicians right now. 
We are trying to understand how to face the political debates and the political challenges that are going on. But we do not have independent media in the country, and that could be hard. Of course, Paul's everything reads are telling us that the majority of those who participate do not want to express their opinions. What should we do then? We are a newspaper and a pretty old one. It was founded in 1952. It was the left wing newspaper for everyone, the Democratic Union newspaper. After the dictatorship, it became a communist party newspaper in Greece or the democratic communism newspaper. And then it became the newspaper that represents the greatest left wing are the radical left, which cares about the environment. And then it became a series of newspapers. So it is a party newspaper. It's always been political. And we have seen opinions from the outside. Everyone has their own opinion, of course regarding Europe, especially. And we were interested in the initiative of transform to create this cooperation between different media in Europe, not only because we need this type of communication, we see it every day. It's not only political, it's also social. We need to create some public opinion in Europe and the left-wing European public opinion. And we also need to decide how to collaborate as soon as possible. If we don't do that, who will? We are the ones who should create this kind of collaboration in this sector in this difficult time. Thank you. Grazie mille, Artiris. Adesso ricominciamo il giro cercando cortesemente se potete di stare in quattro minuti. Thank you so much. Let's start again with another round table. I'll ask you please to keep within four minutes because after that we have a second round table with other speakers. So I kindly ask you to stay within four minutes. I would like to start again with Roberto. What, in your opinion, would be an interesting aspect to start a European debate among, debate among us? Thank you, Roberto, you have the floor. We cannot hear you, though. You're mute. Your mic is mute. Sorry. Well, I believe that uh, we should uh, build a political interaction. We have many topics. Uh, we were um, hearing uh, Spain and Salvini said uh, he feels as if uh, like the ones who won in Madrid. But it would be interesting to, to, to notice that uh, Salvini is in a government together with the Democratic Party and the Prime Minister is the um, European Central Bank. Some, some people say that he might want to become president of uh, the Republic, and I think he is very important in Europe. He can become one of the leaders of Europe after Angela Merkel. The uh, ruling class uh, can handle situ uh, some situations better than the left wing. We had many experiences. Now we have uh, uh, the government in Spain, for example, the uh, political experience as well, for example, Podemos, etc. We need to make a step forward in order to understand together what happened in politics, to exchange opinions, etc. In order to do so, we need a European politics protagonist. So I think this is one of the main topics. In particular, I believe that we should decide if we want to fight a democratic battle to create a European public opinion. I think this is an important topic for communication media. Can we have a European communication without European mass media? I think that the European left should take care of this democratic gap that exists 
we started this project with a resolution that was approved by the previous parliament by the initiative of a member of parliament that was uh, a member of l'altra europa the other europe with uh, tsipras uh, mr tsipras and uh, um, the resolution said that the european union needs free mass media free public opinion in order to build a grow to, to make the public opinion grow so we must fight in this sense Agiris was saying that uh, uh, the government funds and finances fa mass media that are in favor of the government. Uh, we believe that uh, this mass media system should be helped because it helps democracy. So I believe that this is an important topic in our political fight that we should carry out all together if we agree on the fact that this is a priority for us. This, of course, goes beyond the fact that we should discuss what happens in every country. So we should discuss on this all together. We should build a campaign as, it, as what happened with patents in order to create a democracy in Europe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roberto. Now, let's move back to Gael. Recommendations on topics that could be discussed in the European Union. Yes, I believe that uh, what we need to check and see in the other countries is the following. What crisscrosses the public opinion? Well, 10 years ago, there were topics that really interested our readers. That is to say the dynamics supporting the indignados movement in Spain. So we tried to check how public opinions could question the liberal ideology. Today, in France, the extreme right and the liberals represent 68% of the votes so we will have to see uh, to how we can limit this aspect and from our side we'll have to see uh, how public opinions uh, abroad can play a role and how the left can create guidelines so uh, that uh, trade unions and popular movements can create some pressure. Just to give you an example, I believe that we should check how the ideological battle is won by the right. Today in France, the right uses media to talk about anti-racism. So uh, we're trying to establish a French anti-racism or rather to see if uh, we uh, uh, should follow what is done at the, in the United States. So should we organize meetings only amongst people who are black and therefore uh, discriminated against uh, or whether we should include everyone, people of color and not in these meetings. So those dynamics could be interesting and we should uh, see what's going on in France from uh, a different perspective as well, from a European perspective. So Vincent Dolore is a big French millionaire, owner of media, investing everywhere. And I think about all of our Italian friends, I know you know what I'm talking about. So he has a TV channel that every night and every day uh, is uh, seen, is followed uh, in all the bars and everywhere. So there are anchor people talking about the problem connected to Islam. So uh, spreading fake news continuously. And this uh, in obliges the left uh, to uh, take up all uh, this fight against the fake news. So this supports the idea of extreme right. So at the end of the day, this 
is driven into uh, centrist positions. So we will have to see how public opinions are worked upon. And it should be interesting to show that we are not the only ones. We, uh, we see the same fight in Italy, in Belgium, in Europe, everywhere. So that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Gael. Now let's move back to Italy. Let's listen to your proposals, Leonardo. I am very happy of the other uh, speeches uh, so far because the, there are many interesting ideas and we agree on many, uh, on many of these. So in order to come together and to talk together is a way to strengthen our positions and to propose quality contents to our readers. Very briefly, Argeris was talking about the need to have independent media, newspapers. I'll uh, use this occasion, uh, this opportunity to, to um, say a little bit more of what uh, of, of our newspaper, uh, of our magazine. Sorry, uh, our magazine is not funded by any political party, but we are happy to um, to collaborate with uh, political parties. Uh, Left uh, is a weekly magazine and publishes also a book one, once a month curated by Alessia Gasparini, who is here with us. So here we have the protagonists of this book and it is made up of a series of interviews to workers of the European Union in order to understand the uh, direction in which the work in Europe is going in, during the pandemics. So uh, the topic of uh, work in Europe is a key one because the um, shapes of um, work, the working conditions are, uh, of course, they are different from one another, but if we don't know them, it is quite complicated to, to, to fight together in our countries. Another important topic I was uh, I wanted to mention is secularity. In Italy, one building over five is owned by the Catholic Church and um, the cost that um, of uh, of the Catholic Church on our state is almost 6.7 billion euros. There are many mechanisms with which uh, the church is able to not to pay taxes. And uh, of course, we have to consider the importance of the church and their, of their voice of the church in the topics of bioethics. For example, it is very important. Of course, this is a very important topic for us. The next cover is going to be about um, precisely this. It's going to be uh, issued today and also the civil topics. When Pope Bergoglio said, uh, when he made a statement, a strong statement about, about um, um, against abortion, it was as if paying for a um, killer. And then we also talk about culture and art that are um, basic needs of the people in our opinion just like every other basic need. Just to make an example, a couple of weeks ago, we dedicated our cover to the problem of the um, show business workers who have experienced these uh, huge problems during the pandemic. Um, often they, uh, they couldn't work and they couldn't even receive the funds of the state because often in, in, in Italy and also in other parts of Europe, their contracts, their contracts do not recognize their work. And um, 
They are considered very precarious workers. So many uh, demonstrations took place in Italy and in France as well. So many show business workers asked to uh, be recognized the, as an artist, as a worker. So this is a topic that is really, it has to do with all uh, European countries because these demonstrations took place in Italy and France, but not only. So um, to have our workers in the showbiz uh, uh, discuss and also the workers of the, uh, in, uh, the, the people who work in culture, So we need our politicians to, to talk about this. And to share and exchange best practices from one country to the other. I'm going to just, to just give some uh, uh, brief um, ideas. Of course, we will need some coordination to discuss the most important ones. Another important topic is migration, in my opinion. As we all know, uh, Europe, uh, last fall, the European Commission launched the Pact on Migration. It's a pact that was presented in a very uh, positive way in order to protect rights while well, it actually is a step back because migrants are going to uh, to have to, to do um, asylum seeking. Uh, the, the, um, documents and paperwork in, at the border. So this uh, uh, paper, in my opinion, is, uh, is going backwards in terms of rights of migrants. So these are a few topics that, in my opinion, we could discuss, but we'd be happy to hear your opinions as well. Thank you, Leonardo. Let's go back to Margarita. Let's um, hear her view on this debate. Uh, okay, uh, can you hear me? So, uh, thanks. Uh, so, um, I'm very interested to hear to all of your opinions and I am more than happy to say that I absolutely agree with the idea that we need a pan-European debate we need to discuss ideas on European level as citizens of Europe and members of one huge community, diverse in terms of different countries, but still of one public citizen space. And uh, I think that uh, for now, the key topic that we need to discuss in the core of our media initiative and together with our readers as much as possible is the recovery after pandemics. So the next generation and the implications of the recovery programs for the uh, distinctive countries as well as the whole society. For the beginning, at the beginning of the pandemics, many of the left, left thinkers uh, and left activists believed that the new world that may emerge after the pandemics will be a better version of our world. But the lockdowns and the periods of extra living under extraordinary conditions will permit us to rethink how we lived, how we consumed, how we spent, how we destroyed uh, our environment, and uh, how we tried to stop this destruction successfully. Well, uh, what we see now is that uh, people are rather longing to go back to normalcy and uh, thinking about building a better world is somehow put in the shadow. And what is even more it is the extreme right that profited from the pandemics much more than progressive forces. And this is a huge topic, this is a whole bunch of topics that we need to discuss on pan-European level. How to make the recovery more just and, and uh, how, to, how to recover from this uh, pandemic catastrophe at the same time fighting inequalities that were already a huge problem in unified Europe before the pandemics. How not to destroy the European project by creating a two-zoned Europe when the North and the West is progressing and the East and the South are still, uh, are still being left behind. For if we don't tackle the question of inequalities, we will be left with another couple of unanswered questions. How to stop 
and democratic forces, the extreme right-wing forces from taking gains in Europe. How it is possible to get countries like Poland and Hungary back from the influence of national conservatives who are slowly dismantling what was built in Poland and in Eastern Europe, also thanks to European integration. And uh, we need also to address specific questions uh, of our particular countries. Uh, for in, in Poland, uh, what happened during the pandemics revealed uh, that our uh, public health care system was not ready for crisis times. I think that this may refer also to many of countries of yours. And so we need to talk about these questions. We need to exchange our proposed solution proposals and we need to we need to show to our politicians that we want answers to problems that we experienced during the pandemics that we need to that working people as most of us can also count among working people really need answers to practical questions and we need a new vision and we also need to solve the problems and uh, I was also very happy to uh, hear um, in one of the previous speeches about working people and we need to examine conditions of work, of labor, uh, now under the pandemics and in the recovery times. But it, uh, again, I will come back to questions of inequalities. If we don't tackle this problem and if we don't have a closer look at how the ordinary working people are being forced to pay for the crisis, then uh, our debate will not really progress along. For, we, uh, for any intellectual debate on Europe and European politics cannot be detached from from what the, what the people experience and how people experience that their life is not necessary. Their lives are not, not necessarily changing for better. And this is, I think, uh, the key questions that we need to tackle as journalists, as socially uh, interested people. Thank you very much. Grazie mille, Malgozata. E adesso uh, diamo la parola ad Aris con Aris e sentiamo. Thank you so much. Now we uh, leave the floor to um, Aris. Okay. Well, uh, out of a less in indicative list of subjects, I have chosen to, to say a few words about the effects uh, on labor, on, on the policy measures taken during the pandemic by the governments of the EU member states, as I believe that this is an issue that we should discuss in detail at European level, exchanging experiences and trying to find European solutions. Well, it is true that uh, uh, the European governments, encouraged by the Commission and the European Council, and in order to protect the health of their citizens, they temporarily set aside some of the neoliberal dogmas by implementing, for example, deficit spending policies against the, the rules, the sacred rules of the Stability Pact, which, which has been actually suspended for an indefinite period. We should try and make it this permanent. This is another of our tasks. However, in class societies, even during a state of, of emergency, it is the working classes which pay the higher price for the salvation of the nation, as they say, which is the capitalist system. Uh, well, the same happened and is still happening during the ongoing pandemic crisis. It is true, according to official statistics, Unemployment in the European Union did not increase significantly despite the lockdowns uh, due to job retention schemes, the prohibition of dismissals in some countries, and a big increase of teleworking. I will come back to this later. However, as uh, uh, the Greek Marxist economist uh, Maria Karamesini says in her article included in the 2022 Transform Yearbook, which I suggest you to read, uh, during this exceptional period, the official unemployment rate is not the best indicator of the situation in the European Union labor market, 
which is definitely in deep crisis. The crisis is shown in the big increases of working hours and the huge losses of labor incomes throughout the European Union due to the rise of underemployment and temporary and informal employment. Well, before finishing, I, I, I would like to stress the case of teleworking, because I think this should be a concern for the radical left and the progressive forces in Europe. Uh, um, in, in the aforementioned Karamesini's article, we see that according to official statistics, in 2019, only 3.2% of employees in the European Union regularly worked from home. In an e-survey conduct, conducted by the European Foundation for the Improvement of Living and Working Condition, Eurofound is its name, in April 2020, the corresponding figure was 34%. Just compare the 3.2% with the 34% after some months. This situation is not expected to change dramatically after the end of the pandemic, since employers are enthusiastic from the rise in productivity in this kind of work. So it is obvious that this is a case of a structural change of the capitalist system precipitated by the pandemic, which must be seriously taken into account by the trade unions and the parties of the radical left throughout Europe as it is accompanied by tremendous changes in the lives of workers, which will affect their psychology by increasing isolation and the blurring between working and private life, but also their feeling of belonging to an exploited social class uh, that needs to act collectively through its trade unions for the protection of its interests. So if one adds to these changes in the labor market, the attacks during this period against workers' rights with the practical abandonment of collective bargaining, the objective barriers to strike, uh, uh, we can safely predict that when the pandemic hopefully comes to an end, the European labor market will be in a much worse position than two years ago. So we must cooperate to find answers, common answers, to this very difficult situation. Perfetto. Grazie mille. E adesso passiamo la parola, la parola a Milena. Let's leave the floor to Milena. Let's hear her, the proposals from Austria. Can you well, hear me? <laughs> again, yes. I will say that I just stepped in. I don't really have a huge proposal. We can't proposal. see you, Milena, though. So now. Um, so I'm just going to make a short practical note, maybe because I was also reading through the project um, proposal. Maybe it's just, it would be just interesting to see rather quick how, because I agree on what has been said content-wise on what the issues could be, but I think it might be really interesting to s decide on which setting this project is going to be launched or like the network needs to be launched. I don't know, maybe this is something to have um, sorted out rather early because um, it's not only, it not only touches upon the content wise things that you want to cover, or we would like to cover, but maybe also um, from a practical point of view, what issues um, such alternative media networks are facing and it has always already been addressed, like um, the, the difficulties with, with not being a mass media or how you want to, um, we would like to um, address the conditions under which such an alternative network would have to um, work at least. So that's just a small, small, small remark. Perfetto. Grazie mille, Milena. Thank you, Milena. You were brief, but effective. at this point, we can leave the floor to Gemma and listen to 
the proposals from Madrid. Um, hello again. Um, well, um, I think um, it's very important the cooperation of media, as Gael has uh, been talking about, because uh, sometimes uh, even in our part, in our um, Unidas Podemos, in, in all our people, we are working so much and doing so many things, we are unable to cover all, all of it. There are so many things uh, going on and we have uh, no, no time. There's, uh, sometimes there's uh, too much uh, things uh, going around and I think uh, it's bad uh, for the democracy, for information to have uh, more clear ideas. So, and I think it's very good to uh, don't uh, work uh, too much in the, everybody in the same things, but uh, to share uh, some works uh, we, we are, uh, we are already have done and um, we know that uh, the left we are very good in ideas in programs in analysis but uh, what uh, i miss sometimes is how to translate it uh, to the people in we have an article of one of uh, one of our uh, contributors which is uh, it's very funny it's very polemic it's very clever uh, he said that uh, sometimes we have to talk uh, to the language of people talks in the bars and to have arguments with them. So as I've been unable to send you photographs, I sent you two, two links here by the, by the chat and it's uh, for two messages sent by the right. Uh, one of them, if you open, <coughs> sorry, one of them, the first one is a huge, uh, Photograph we see in the in the tube uh, in a portal sol in so many places, and it's um, they compare the unaccompanied uh, minor migrants uh, with the uh, old uh, and um, old grandma. So the the immigrants who if you open the um, the link they are like um, uh, delinquents like uh, robbers like uh, and they uh, we are paying. Uh, 2,000 euros uh, per each every month. But uh, for the grandma, it's only 400. So um, people uh, keep that idea and talk about that idea. You know, how Minos immigrants have a lot of money. We are paying them a lot of money, even if uh, they are vandalic people, and that's a, a poor grandma. And the other link I send you is, um, is the program of the right who won the elections. The program of um, Isabella Ayuso. So if you open it, and when we received the, the letter, the electoral letter in our mailbox, it was only freedom. It's all the program, freedom. And all the, all the campaign, it was about freedom, 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 which is our freedom. <laughs> and so they work with very, very basic uh, ideas uh, to put in people's mind and to take to the to the bars to take to uh, to the mentality of people so um, i think um, you know and also we have to to struggle with the media the the campaign of the for the rights and the far right made by the media is um, is, uh, is amazing, it's very, very, very strong. It's very hard uh, to, you know, to face it. And so, um, because of that, I think we, we need to work together uh, to, to face uh, that, uh, to face them. I'm, I'm very, I'm agree with the idea of uh, Milena and Gael about um, the, one of the, of the things we have to, to work, I think, is uh, about the uh, uh, people, problems of uh, labor people, uh, conflicts of uh, labor people, and what's, uh, what's happening to people, you know, because we said that uh, uh, immigrants uh, receive a lot of money, a lot of public money, but uh, nobody talks about uh, if you take your, uh, your kid to the public school, uh, we, we pay you 900 euros per year per kid, and we don't have uh, that money for the, you know, to invest in the in the public school, so we don't have the, we 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 are unable to to send that messages to people. 
Uh, and I think um, it will be very, very good to work about uh, how, to, how to be able to communicate our ideas uh, to, to rich people and how to do it uh, together, how, how to work the best, uh, the best way. And so uh, everything we can do will be very welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Now let's go to the round table with Archidis and let's listen to his videos. Yes. Ridiculous European government and politicians with their inability gave us another reason to break up this mediatic wall. They can say the exact contrary of what's going on. They have no shame doing that. Yesterday, Everyone was in favor of Biden and when talking about Big Pharma. This is ridiculous. I think this is where our challenge is. We need to start collaborating without a language that nobody understands. We need to take advantage of our online tools to communicate with everyone. And I'm saying this because we have both an online version and a paper version of our newspaper. And we have to start from today, we need to start widening our horizon. And we need to find some cooperation from other newspapers, from other countries. We need to start including other people in a spirit of cooperation. Let's try to unite artists, activists, intellectual activists. We have a heritage to you, and we need to help these people express it, to talk about what's going on. And I believe that if we start doing this job and carrying out this uh, we will have multiple effects, we will have greater outcomes compared to the little efforts that this will require. And I can see Alessia is nodding. Maybe it will also be your task because you are managing all of us. Of course, it will be my pleasure. So, yes, it will also be your responsibility to let us cooperate more often. Thank you. Of course, I won't waste any more of your time. Thank you. Thank you, Arteris. At this point, I would like to give the floor to Stefano Villiers, who will moderate the second part of our debate. And thank you all for the proposals and the press initiatives that you proposed in this first part. Over to Stefano. Thank you, Alessia. Thank you so much. Thank you and good morning, everyone. It was very interesting to listen to this first part of our session, and I hope the second part of it is interesting. I don't know if Roberto already connected our other guests for today, the other participants. I can already see Simona. <laughs> My director. So if we're all here, if we're ready to start, I can. I think we can start. We are a few minutes late. So I will start with this concept. Many of your presentations already facilitated us because we're actually talking about some topics that we would like to tackle during this event. The topic of information and the issues related to spreading information in the whole European continent and throughout the European Union. As a left collaborator, part of the um, transform 
department, I deal with topics related to immigration. And I would like to thank Gemma for the interesting things that she said. I would start with this story. Our country in the past abolished censorship, but we know that around certain topics, there is some kind of censorship, especially with standard press and public press. Censorship does exist. Uh, a left wing that is too radical or too uncomfortable for certain standard topics should not exist. The workplace doesn't exist for news, it only exists when some tragic, dramatic news comes up. For example, the three people who die at the workplace every day. We never talk about that unless something something special happens. This event can be a starting point to say, starting from the critical situation that we live in our countries, let's ask ourselves, how can we elaborate a different structure of counter-information, which would actually mean real information? So my first question is very simple. What is your opinion, this question goes to all directors starting from Roberto from Transform Italia. What is the status of information in each country? Do we have real pluralism? Do we have a chance give voice to different, to different voices. It might sound like a rhetorical question, but it's not. Please, Roberto, I'll leave it to you. Thank you, Stefano. I believe what we've been talking about is Roberto Musacchio doing his introduction when he was talking about the battle of ideas. That is the main topic we should think about. I think our current Italian scenario, as well as in other countries, represents a media power which is trying to conform and homologate all political The fact that we have a government that is from the liberal left wing of the Democratic Party to over to the right wing of this situation reveals a common feeling this eh, is the background we are living. How can we build a new point of view? How can we give strength to left-wing ideas? These are the priorities that we need to undertake with the pandemic. As other speakers sembrava che il discorso del ruolo del pubblico, il ruolo delle politiche dei beni comuni, in qualche modo anche al centro dell'opinione pubblica, oggi vediamo che c'è un ritorno al a conflict with our public. We are not able to identify personal freedom because it is not expressing mass needs, the needs of all people, all countries. We saw that during the elections, we saw the 
Poland. Le prestazioni dei, eh, de, delle destre che rifiutano, usavano l'utilizzo della mascherina per ridurre using mask, face mask. We are seeing all that and I believe we should put in place di una narrazione, di un racconto dei nostri paesi e di un'Europa che a united Europe, a Europe nei beni comuni, nella capacità di creare le condizioni perché tutti i cittadini siano ci trovano spuntati credo che questo l'esigenza che abbiamo I believe the need that we have. ci siamo messi in moto per costruire questo questo, questo appuntamento è esattamente costruire le condizioni per Just creare like the events that we organize today. We are trying to create possible better tools than the ones we have now. Mentre la destra while the right wing and other political forces are trying to act at a European level, the left wings in all countries still seem to be limited in their own national field. And this might be an obstacle to the possibility of having a greater voice at a European level be able to relaunch in each single country a left-wing proposal, an alternative proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Adesso io darei la parola. I would like to give the floor to Patrick Leary, the director of Humanité. Humanité il rapporto è di, di lunga data. We have been working with him for a long time. It was a very important collaboration. Punto di vista di quello che avviene the European background in general. Sia molto molto importante anche per pensare appunto a strategia comune. And of course this cooperation is also important to think about common strategies. But thank you and I'll leave the floor to you now. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour à Thank you. Thank you very much. And good morning to everyone. I would like to thank the organizers and all the people in charge of the organization of this webinar, of this meeting, which is very important in order to share pieces of information all together about something that nowadays is fundamental. So today we're here to talk about information, but we are all facing a new, and we are trying to find out a new way in order to uh, accept uh, the situation that we are li living in at the moment. So capitalism is now facing a crisis. And we need to find answers and we need to have new instruments concerning the sharing of pieces of information that could be available for us all. Nowadays, the concentration of capitals within the media sector is extremely important. So we have nine billionaires actually around the world having the ownership of the biggest media companies. Of course, there are just a couple of exceptions uh, when talking about public TVs and public radios. So there is still a presence of the public sector when it comes to radio or TV, but this, um, this impedes to have a right of pluralism when we talk about freedom of expression and freedom of information. So we need to focus on this 
concept, we need to focus the importance of the pluralism of ideas. And we need to understand if nowadays it is still possible actually to have this kind of pluralism. I mean, nowadays we have several means um, and several instruments in order to share pieces of information. We have the digital devices, for example. So we have the possibility to have an immediate access to different pieces of information coming from all over the world. But it also increases and homologation of pieces of information. So for example, if we consider an, uh, a topic which is an actual topic that is really important for us all from the European left wing, that is to say the topic about patents that we have already mentioned before, well, the majority of press, apart from Humanité, decided to uh, work with the progressive uh, powers. And so there was the publication of several articles trying to explain how it was possible. Whereas uh, patents, even when it comes to vaccines, we know that it is the result of a research. So nowadays, the vaccine is the result of a great research on molecules that, of course, have been existing for a long period of time and that were used in order to fight against other diseases and pathologies that nowadays are, uh, and nowadays those molecules are used in order to fight against COVID-19. So we can see that medias are at, more or less at the service of the big pharma company. And so a kind of information aiming not to propose vaccines to the entire planet. So there is a real fight that we are experiencing at the moment. Another thing I would like to add concerning our country and concerning pandemic, in our country, there was a great limitation of uh, liberties and, and of freedoms, of course, and I think that it is the same situation in other countries. And I think it would be very good to talk about those topics on a European level, to talk about freedom, to talk about the patents, to talk about the vaccines and the pandemic in general, because I think it is really good actually to have an exchange of the articles that we publish in order to make them available to the greater public to a progressive movement, to other movements and institutions, so that everybody will understand that we are facing something extremely general at the moment. And so we decided to add the word health next to emergency. So we, we talk about health emergency in order to uh, make those decisions more acceptable by the greater public, but those decisions are against some laws, and those laws impede journalists to properly carry out their work, actually. So we are not facing anymore the same censorship that we had in the past, but we are facing another problem that is based on safety, security, on the protection concerning public uh, buildings and public institutions, of course. But and, and in that way, there is a, a limit imposed to the freedom of information and so to the possibility for every citizen to receive proper pieces of information. And all those aspects are, of course, fundamental and they are deeply in line, actually, with the situation in other countries. As for example, the fact that working class becomes almost invisible at the moment. And the same happens for other classes, of course, in other countries. And this is deeply linked to the geopolitical uh, topics uh, on a European, but also international scale. So we try to actually unite, actually, and gather the, uh, the working class. So I think that all those aspects are fundamental. L'Humanité is now working on those topics. And uh, I know that it is the only um, newspaper actually in uh, France 
insisting on those topics because all the other medias are uh, two words, let's say the right wing of politics. But nowadays, a continuous and ongoing exchange of pieces of information, even thanks to TV, keeps on stressing those topics, so that is to say safety and security or terrorism, in order to um, guide actually the public opinion uh, towards uh, those ideas. So we need to fight. We have a great fight actually in front of us so that we will be able to offer some other um, elements for the greater public in order to start thinking in a new way and also to support the people reading our uh, newspaper, actually. Another thing I would like to share with you all concerns the development of uh, the uh, digital um, instruments and devices. So nowadays, because of that, we need to find out new models, actually, to, to follow. Because of course, we need journalists, we need top quality uh, articles, uh, even when we talk about the digital world, of course. We need to fight so that European unions will be able to offer us the right tools to assure a pluralism of information and a pluralism of publication, of course. So I think that we need to work together in order to insist on the, the importance of that kind of freedom. I have already stressed the importance of this topic when working at a European level. Right now I'm not working at that level anymore, but I still think it is a fundamental issue. Right now, the spectrum of European information is based on the right wing of politics. So I think that it is the right time to act. And I really hope that several other meetings, such as this one, would be feasible and in the future, of course, and maybe in a virtual way like today, or uh, having the possibility to meet uh, to really meet actually one, one another so that we can really work together, we can cooperate together, and we will have a greater success, of course. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you again. Thank you, Patrick. You talked about our approach in an effective way and also about what we would like to have as a common spirit. At this point, I will give the floor to Simona Maggiarelli, director of Left Italy, one of the newspapers that is trying in Italy to tackle situations directly, also regarding freedom of speech, independence of information, which is very relevant. We have been talking about the topic during the first part of our political and financial groups together with cultural pressure coming from the Catholic Church. These factors are something that we need to tackle. And it is difficult as a black owned country to do that. I'll give you the first Simona. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you, everyone. I would like to thank Transform for uh, welcoming our initiative from left to create a network. I talked about it with the help of Roberto and all of other decided to organize this day. I would like to thank all of those who participated to this event. Our first panel was rich in ideas and initiatives, and everything was pretty concrete. So to answer your question, we know that the situation in Italy is really bad right now from the point of view of pluralism. Berlusconi is the owner of our media sets network. <laughs> 
and we also have the owners of let's say the incubator let's area our public tv network is actually pretty political we've been talking about this real accident on may 1st one of our rappers Perez, was censored during his speech supporting the um, decree and he decided to support the law by citing, by mentioning the homophobic sentences declared by our right-wing politician. That was a, a scandal related to the censorship of our public networks. As Roberto Mosacchi was saying, we are living in a situation right now in Italy where we have a wide government with different political views and in which we have no position in parliament, basically because the opposition would be Fratelli d'Italia, Brothers of Italy. But they do have another side of the government, the right wing. So we are having a situation in which we have no opposition, no voices. So at least in standard newspapers, we have no opposition voices. And the influence of our Catholic Church is stronger than ever, especially in public networks. We cannot we cannot intervene on certain topics without the presence of priests or other um, church personalities. It is not simple, as we said, to express a voice as a weekly newspaper, even online. We have a website, of course. It is an independent initiative with public financing, so we are quite special in Italy, so to say. Roberto Pago, as a pure editor, it allowed us to go forward to create a new political view in, the, in our left wing. That's very ambitious, I know that, but we might be able to talk about this later on. And to answer Stefano's question, how can we counter information? We, as Humanité, and as our colleague Leonardo Filippi reminded us, we were one of the first ones to support the battle um, vaccines as a common good. Since the beginning, we observed the pandemic from a global point of view. Internationalism is one of our benchmarks as well. And the pandemic is forcing us to do that and to think like that. Neoliberal politicians are failing right now in doing that. Let's just look at what happened in Italy, northern Italy, where there have been more infections and industrial sec sections applied a neoliberal ideology, thus implying a real catastrophe in terms of infection for the sake of production, without safeguarding work. This is why we need to um, tackle this approach and we need to see how we are failing in this. The pandemic is requiring global solutions. The denialism regarding vaccines is not only stupid, it is a severe human problem because if the pandemic continues spreading in other countries, we will never get out of this. Counter information, fighting against fake news, which is another task that we are undertaking. We, we are trying to fight against fake news coming from the denialist and uh, extreme right wing world. And we're also trying to interpret the philosophy that goes behind these approaches. Some politicians, such as the party, said that vaccines have to be given to people according to their GDP, according to their financial situation. We are trying to tackle these absurd solutions. We're trying to build a structure against the violence of these thoughts. 
Related to fake news, Stefano Galliani's sources are pillar when talking about la the fight against false narrations about migration in Italy. As you know, we've also we've been talking about the invasion of of immigrants in Italy, and we've tried to um, to go against those decrees that violate human rights, literally. Right now, more than ever, I would like to conclude because I want to be brief. I am convinced that we need high quality information, left wing newspaper representations to be able to let our voices be listened. Otherwise, we risk uh, remaining trapped into our national borders, national limits, and this won't allow us to acquire new rights, new knowledge, new information, and especially right now during the pandemic, one of our main rights is the right to know everything, the right to accessing scientific knowledge and scientific information. Our Humanité colleague this morning was presenting um, his newspaper and now I'm showing you mine with this wonderful cover representing the power of research. Thank you. Thank you, Simona. Now I, I leave the floor to Aris. Greece knows um, what it means to fight, to build uh, decent uh, information. My point of view is that there has been a wonderful season uh, for the left in power, but it uh, and it happened also thanks to the ability to inform citizens of what was happening in their country, of who was the who was to be held accountable for the damage. Am I wrong or am I right, Aris? Unfortunately, the only uh, thing I heard is that you asked me something. I have a, real, a very big problem uh, with uh, my connection and I hope that uh, this doesn't apply to, to your uh, side and that you and listen to me. Is, is that right? Can you listen to me or sh should I abandon? Say, uh, yes, yes. Harris, you can. Yes, Sorry, Aris. It was, it was a, a terrible thing, uh, especially during this last session. Uh, well, in that sense, uh, I will just have to, to read what I have prepared uh, and uh, hope that uh, it is of some interest to you. So, although it is, uh, I could say initially, it's. I, I, I thought. I think that we have two rounds. Isn't that so? That in the first we just uh, speak about the narrative of, of the mass media, and in the second we have some proposals. Anyway, this is the way I have structured my intervention. So the first part uh, is my first part is more, I would say, general and. Uh, in a way, uh, philosophical, or I would say, le le left-wing. Um, well, uh, mainstream media as an integral part of the ideological state apparatuses play a crucial role during crisis. First, they try to put the blame for the crisis to sinister external forces and or to unexpected events, to external shocks not related to the system. The next step of their narrative is a discourse based on the need of national unity and common sacrifices in order to face the unexpected event or the aggressive enemy, which is summarized in the motto, now we are all in the same boat. For European mainstream media, 
the pandemic crisis was an ideal case for this kind of narrative and discourse. We are in front of a situation that could not be predicted where a very dangerous virus either came down from heaven or was due to an unjustifiable fault of an enemy nation, China. Faced with this extreme danger, the benevolent and of course neutral state has to intervene to protect its nationals and in doing this, it is legitimized to use every means at its disposal, even the most authoritarian and undemocratic. Furthermore, in this unequal battle, there can be human losses, which could not be avoided, as well as police violence against people who disobey orders regarding the keeping of social distancing. There can be also people who will lose their jobs and be left without any means to survive. All these things, the narrative says, are natural side effects of a tragic crisis that could not be predicted. That's what we hear in the Greek news, at least. This is a convenient but untrue story, a story which should be deconstructed by the independent media like ours. Uh, the independent media, especially of the left, which understand the information they offer to the people as a common and not as a commodity sold at the marketplace by the media companies in order to bring direct or indirect profits to their owners, increase their influence to the authorities or safeguard together with them the existing social order. So what can independent media, media like ours, do in a case like this? What kind of information and analysis can we give to our readers in order to deconstruct the myth of the mainstream media? My view is that what we have to do is to reveal the truth. There are facts that should become known. First, that the outbreak of the pandemic was not an unexpected event in the same way that neither the explosions in the nuclear plants of Chernobyl and Fukushima nor the Amazon fires were unexpected accidents. The pandemic is a product of the globalized neoliberal capitalist system and an expected result, as scientists say, of deforestations and, wild, and wildlife transnational trade. And we should not forget that the European Union is one of the constituent parts of this globalized capitalism. Second, that the number of human sacrifices would have been much lower should the public health systems were not underfunded and understaffed following decades of neoliberalism where health has become and still is a commodity. Then, that more lives could have been saved if there was a better EU coordination in the procurement and the distribution of vaccines, and that the vaccines nationalism is a crime against humanity. That, in the pandemic, uh, as in all natural disasters and crises, we are not all in the same boat. But there are people who are more vulnerable than others, poor people living in crowded neighborhoods where keeping social distances is a joke. There are men and women who cannot work from home and have to commute daily to their jobs using overcrowded public transport. Okay, so we know the truth, but how can we disseminate it to the people? Overcoming the propaganda and the fake news, the concealment of truth of the uh, mainstream media. I believe that this is something that we should uh, deal with in the second part. Okay? Or not? Or shall I continue now? Okay. Okay, Eris. Yes, you are absolutely right. 
You might move on to the proposals if you want, so that we can all move on to the proposals. Please, okay. Aris, go on. Okay. So, uh, well, uh, I believe that our chances to, to take a considerable share of the market dominated by the mass media uh, are, um, are very slim, uh, especially in the printed media. Due to the finan to financial reasons, due to the power of the prevailing mass ideology, due to to, to long-established beliefs and norms of the people. Well, things are a little better in the electronic media, but not much better. So when we make our plans to be more effective, we must not forget that as the mad media are part of a group of sources who want things to remain as they are, we are part of another group who wants to change the world. This means that at national level, we must establish peer-to-peer -peer relationships with people who share the same values with us. Those who can read us or listen to us who feel that they are part of a common project. We must learn from them and they must learn from us. We should not decrease the quality of our product, but at the same time, we should try to learn from the experiences, not be elitist. We must try to establish the same relations of, trusts, of trust with social movements, cultural initiatives, mainly of young people, respected political periodicals and other publications like the Jacobin New Left Review, the Monthly Review, the Mont Diplomatique, and of course, radical left parties, but also with enlightened sections of the bourgeois parties. And finally, we must share news and experiences with our friends and comrades in media, in Europe and other countries. In Epochi, Epoch, uh, my newspaper, we are proud for our international news, which uh, take 16% of the pages of our weekly publication. People knowing foreign languages, English, French, German, Italian, Spanish, read daily foreign newspapers and the electronic editions and provide our readers with information and analysis of events happening in various countries. At the same time, we have a network of permanent and casual Greek and foreign correspondents in some countries who very willingly contribute opinion articles, news from the places they live in. I finish by saying that our media alliance would expand and systematize this kind of experience in ways we have to discover. One possibility is the regular exchange of articles, the staging of electronic events so that we become known and know each other at the same time, the so-called webinars <laughs> during this period, but also live events in particular, in occasions like the festival, festivals of new papers and parties, starting from the huge festival of uh, Humanité. Grazie, Aris. Uh, ottimi suggerimenti. Thank you, Aris. Very good proposals. Uh, this is the real, the, the practical part of what we should and could do together in this alliance that we are promoting. I, at the, now I like to ask Patrick, what we can start uh, doing together from his point of view of l'Humanité. This alliance we are, we are building should not make the work of, jur of journalists and directors and editors even harder. It must become something more, something additional that every newspaper should have and a, a space, a room for debate with other countries of Europe. So we don't want to make our work even harder 
we uh, small newspapers uh, have, have to work very very hard much more than uh, big newspapers bye patrick patrick you have the floor uh, there must be some connection problem Let's see if we can solve it. Forse Simona, allora parlo due cose. Simona, would you like to take the floor and then uh, if we reconnect, we'll go back. Yes, so he, Patrick is going to close. I absolutely agree with Aris. I believe he made a wonderful program. It's quite concrete as well and tangible with the idea of the festival and why not? We could reconnect to the Festival of L'Humanité or we can build a new festival of our new network. So our challenge is huge, especially in the moment we're living in. I talked about fake news before and the uh, creation of the non-information. But here we have to uh, create a new world, a new paradigm, uh, different from the neoliberalism, a new world, a new way of uh, living together, of uh, creating the labor market, of um, building a work-life balance. We should give a voice to those who don't have a voice and to start reflecting, focusing on health, and psychological and physical well-being of people left to uh, focus on this a lot, the need of art and culture. We should really um, reimagine, recreate cities in a more human dimension, in a regeneration, re modernization of our cities. So all are the topics we should discuss about um, at a European level, so which we could start by exchanging articles, absolutely. We could have a website where we can do this uh, exchange and uh, we might look for new uh, European financing um, methods. Um, Roberto Musacchi said that this at the beginning, uh, we already have um, Eurozin which is like a window uh, where we have all uh, European newspapers, but uh, we have more of an idea of uh, a political lab somehow, a think tank somehow. So this synergy, as Stefano was saying, if we can build this synergy, we can really strengthen our work. I'll make an example. We, uh, our Polish colleague was here. So to give a, an international voice of the um, women's fight in Poland and not only the Polish women and do this as a network, well, this could be a wonderful uh, concrete example of what we could do together. Thank you. Thank you, Simona. The support we could give to a very difficult battle, the one of our um, fellow Polish women, it's a, absolutely a dramatic situation and nobody talks about this in the rest of our continent. Unfortunately, I believe that Patrick had some connection problems. I would like to, to ask Gael if he's here, he is connected with us, if he would like to, uh, to, to give us some insights for our possible collaboration, starting from a context like this, that in my opinion, it must be expanded. Unfortunately, uh, Mariana Carneiro is not here with us today uh, from Esquerda.net. She had some uh, um, problems at work. She couldn't be here with us today because the people who, who work who, like us, we have to 
to perform many different uh, functions. So it would be wonderful to, to work together as a uh, public service. It would be a huge, important public service. I leave the floor to Gal. Uh, Aris mentioned l'humanité, so you really have to, to, to say something about that. So first of all, we would be extremely happy nous avions dû la tenir en 2020 dans un format plus réduit. Invité au meilleur endroit de l'humanité. Et nous serons très plaisants de nous rencontrer ensemble pour être village du monde. Bon, en tout cas, on sera heureux de vous inviter. Je vois que Patrick est ici maintenant. Non, peut-être que je suis mal. Donc, vous êtes tous invités à la célébration de l'humanité. And we will celebrate together with other magazines and newspapers and journals. And I think that in the future, we will also be able actually to keep on exchanging savoir, and sharing uh, pieces of information among us all, among us journalists, of course, because that would be extremely good. As uh, my colleagues said before, I think it would be very good actually for everybody to know the contents and the work of uh, other colleagues from the entire world, from Europe, so that we will know uh, which are the plans and the programs in Italy, in Greece, in Spain, and so on and so forth, so that we will all be able to better understand the differences and the situation, of course, in each country. And I think that uh, this kind of website or anyway digital sharing would be very good even for our readers so that they will be able to get more pieces of information. Of course, we are already doing that uh, thanks to the internet and thanks to the th thanks to other colleagues from the Solidaire um, uh, newspaper and we share some articles that at the moment are only available in French, but uh, we uh, publish those articles on l'humanité and vice versa. And of course, uh, this is a great exchange, of, a fruitful exchange for us all. And again, I think that working in that way would be extremely good for everybody in Europe and all over the world. Uh, we are happy you're back with us. Unfortunately, uh, online connections sometimes fail. I, we asked Gael to take the floor uh, before you. So um, in order to, to think about how to, to keep working together, have you got any recommendation, any advice on how to go on in a tangible way in order to um, let everyone know that something is changing? Vedo che continuano problemi di connessione forse. Patrick? Maybe he still has some connection problems. Your mic is off, Patrick. He's frozen. No. Excusez-moi, j'ai des gros... Here I am. I'm sorry. I'm having some internet issues and connection issues. And I had to restart the computer again. So what was your question, Stefano? So we, were, we asked Gale to tell her... Uh, to tell his opinion about this. In your opinion, how can we move on uh, in our work as an alliance? How can we... Uh, how can we have other people to, to know that we are changing uh, the way we work in the left uh, media? So we needed to try to work on something together and on the short period 
I think that it is necessary to create a more regular system in order to better exchange pieces of information among us all and to exchange articles, of course. Maybe every once in a while we could create like a list of journalists and activists and people, or maybe we can create, for example, a wider and European uh, network. We could organize some events in different countries, of course, entre nous et puis d'initiatives entre nous également qui soient there are some great initiatives that could be fostered that could be strengthened of course even abroad évidemment de nos nos pouvoirs nationaux mais we could talk about other for and other initiatives and actions that we could institutions européennes sensibiliser our governments but first of all i think that it is necessary to start with a debate together with european institutions to increase their awareness and then especially talking about the european commission and the european council of course because there are no commissioners uh, within the European Commission in charge of a communication, actually, but they only talk about the competition among, um, among journalists and medias in general. So we keep on talking about competition and that's all. I think it is necessary to think about a common path I think we need to talk about the existence of our of our journals and the existence of, the existence of a real pluralism because we know sometimes it is really difficult to keep on working in this environment in this European environment and in this situation so it is necessary to train other people maybe starting from today we could get in touch with other friends and other people that maybe are not here with us today and we could suggest them to join our initiative so that we will be able to broaden our network because of course if the network will be greater then we'll be even more successful i'm sorry again for the technical issues we know that sometimes technology is not oh, no problem Thank it's you. technological problems uh, uh, might happen. I, before leaving the floor to Roberto Morea, our host, for the conclusions uh, and, uh, and for a new start, for a fresh start, I would like to thank you personally. This idea is, uh, we, we often discuss this in Azione Diretta. So not to talk as it, to, about European Union as if it were foreign policies. We want to talk about the European Union as if it were domestic affairs. This is a demonstration of how we could start sh making a shift in the mainstream media. As it's, it is as if what happens in Greece or in France or wherever, is, it has nothing to do with us, but they are actually very close to us. So I thank you professionally and personally. I leave the floor to Roberto Marea and thank you so much. Thank you, Stefano. As you were saying, um, we don't have real conclusions, it's a fresh start. We want to take responsibility and to keep on working together. Um, we had heard a lot of food for thought today, many interesting insights, and we want to keep working on that. As a media alliance, we can start imagining a collective work, to work together. We could collect articles and start um, writing a monthly issue, a sort of insert in our newspapers it, with all the um, insights for our European debate from our colleagues. So this is one of the first steps we could do. So creating a portal, a web portal, a website that can work 
For us, it, this could be a next step, but before, uh, before that, uh, we need uh, economic resources as well. And I think we have to, as Simona was saying before, we have to, to find them first. So, uh, as Media Alliance, this is something we can do together. Um, we can start with that. What Aris was saying, his uh, suggestion uh, is, uh, is very smart in my opinion. He was saying that we could uh, try and sit together at a table during events or um, situations that can be interesting to all, for all of us. So, well, I think this is uh, something that we can do together, start, starting from immediately. We can start, I mean, maybe the 21st of May is too early, but I'll make an example. The Global Health Summit that is going to take place around the G20 in Rome, it might be an element of um, debate that we can do together at a European level. The elections in Madrid are relevant for our um, left in Europe. So what Patrick was saying now, the fact that um, we must invest also politically, the parliament, the uh, European institutions, there is a lack of um, democracy in our information and so we, sh we should really um, pledge to change this. We were, uh, the, the resolution of the European Parliament was mentioned, the signature of Barbara Spinelli. We think we should create a uh, a new momentum for media and the plurality of information in Europe. This is the task we have to carry on and we have to promote with journalists, intellectuals, our colleagues, and we have to fight together in this. So this is not easy. This is what is uh, going to, to happen. And uh, Patrick is right. We have to collaborate also with other people. We should engage other activists and media that we still uh, haven't involved, and we must feel part of this collective project. This is going to um, give more strength to uh, our work. So once again, thank you. We created a mailing list, collective mailing list, we're going to send the report of what we said. And I would like to announce that if you agree, we will publish on Transform Europe, the synthesis, uh, the summary of what um, we discussed today. We're going to do that in English at a European level, and uh, it can be published um, in your own languages, of course. in uh, uh, your uh, newspapers and magazines. So uh, it's going to be available uh, and uh, let's keep working together. Thank you once again, uh, thank you so much and uh, let's uh, meet again soon. Thank you. Have a good day. I would like to thank and the interpreters as well
who helped us in our work. Thank you. Thank you so much.